This is Gail Morgan thanking you for watching the Libertarian Counterpoint each Thursday at 8 p.m. Channel 17 on Comcast, on YouTube, and on Facebook. I'm James Justin, and thank you for watching. Joining me today is Kalish Mero. Kalish, you've joined us before, and I want to talk to you today because I had an opportunity as one of my other, um, shall we say, duties as a, uh, oh, what term I'm looking for, a, Anyway, as my as my my job of running for a candidate, I guess what we would call it is some I was contacted by the ferret uh, organization, an organization looking for ferrets. And I didn't know it was an issue about ferrets, and I know you had what you call cat snakes. And so I was yeah. like, well, who do I talk to when I want to learn about an issue? And so I went and talked to I called Kalish and asked if you wanted to come on and have a chat about them. Yeah, I'm excited to. We yeah. are. In my household, yeah, we, we call our ferrets cat snakes because they are discriminated against in California. So they self-identify as cat snakes around here. <laughs> yeah, I, I did a little dig digging into the issue. They contacted me on the campaign page. And so I went and did a little digging um, just to see what it's kind of about. And it's confusing. I don't understand why the Department of Fish and Game has decided to regulate ferrets. It doesn't make any sense. I mean, it's it seems to me that they're kind of interjecting on a statewide level that's something that probably should be done on a local level. If there's an issue, it should be, you know, if there's a local environmental issue, which I know nothing about, I don't know if it is or isn't, but that should be done on a local issue, on a local level. Yeah, I, I'm, so I'm not going to say like a mini expert on in the field or whatever. I'm just definitely coming on as, as somebody who, who has them and can kind of mm -hmm. talk about their personalities and what they uh, the extent of how domesticated they are and kind of how silly these laws are. Uh, like I said, I'm not sure when they came online. I feel like a, the, the law came online. I feel like it's been for quite some time. Um, but, you know, they're, the law basically is saying that the they're like an invasive species, that they would throw off the ecosystem if they got out and we had like these crazy feral ferret populations going on uh, but really what it comes down to is that they're so highly domesticated that their their survival rate would be very low even if they did get out and go feral the other thing was that a lot of because uh, it's really the, I think just California and Hawaii that criminalize them uh, everywhere else they're legal and um, anywhere else that you get them, normally before they even get to a pet store or anything like that, they've already been spayed, neutered, and even dissented to, because they're part of the, uh, I'm gonna say it wrong, but musalads, they're part of that family. So it's the same as like skunks, weasels, polecats, or descended from polecats, um, otters, those kinds of animals. But uh, yeah, it, it, before they even go to the home, they've already been spayed or neutered. Yeah, it seems to me like, you know, the reasonable issues. I kind of think back into the thing back in time and the first person who decided to domesticate a dog. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty sure that the village was not happy that some guy was bringing in essentially a wolf or a coyote and just domesticating a wolf and a coyote. But yet we couldn't even imagine life without dogs and, or, and pets now or cats. We used to have an empty field across the street from the house and we had a cat colony, big, huge cat colony that caused all kinds of problems in the neighborhood. They finally built a building there, and so the cats have gone away. But, you know, the domestic cats cause these kind of problems. So I haven't tried to see what the difference is between a ferret and, say, a, a cat colony that gets out of control. So, you know, what's funny is uh, we were we were kind of digging into it of like, okay, because we're, we're pretty open about having them, you know, what what's the risk of them ever being taken away, th those kinds of things. And um, it seems, you know, just in our research that – it turns out that they suspect that California actually has the highest population of ferret ownership in the country. Um, and they base that off of just sales because, well, you can't own or sell or transport, you know, across state lines, uh, ferrets or anything like that. They can still sell the food at, uh, at pet stores. Like I can go get ours over here at our local pet smart, which is just kind of funny. But so just based off that information, they've been able to assess that California probably has the highest ferret population. And yet we don't have roving ferret. Well, they're literally called businesses. They're called a business if it's a group of them, but we don't have roving businesses of ferrets <laughs> in all, over the, all over California. And if anything, too, they were their their history is helping farmers. They would 
because they're diggers and um, and uh, a predatory animal, they would go and seek out pests, you know, rabbits and gophers that would disrupt the uh, farmer's fields. So they're actually pretty helpful. Yeah, and it, one of these things, it's always kind of what they call it, the cobra effect. You never really know what's going to happen when you introduce a new species. And so you can kind of understand the fear, but at the same time, you know, species getting moved around and humans moving around is kind of part of nature. It's part of evolution, right? No species stays in where they're at the spot where they were initially evolved. I mean, you know, we, every species moves, every species migrates. And so there's a kind of a natural ability to this. But it just, it seems so strange to me that I was kind of, I spent a good hour and a half kind of looking into ferrets. And I'm going, I've never even thought about a ferret before. And I spent an hour and a half, just, I was kind of in, interested in it. And I know I've watched you guys, your family, you guys play with your guys, your ferrets and you get your cat snakes. And you seems like everybody's having a good time to me. Every time I get to, I see you watch it. I mean, they're like anything. My hamster, when I was a kid, would get out and go sneak into my mom's, you know, sock drawer or whatever and eat socks. So, you know, there's the same problems that, <laughs> yeah. that all pets have. So it, it just seems to me that I don't, I just didn't understand how we got to this point where we have a ferret lobby group, you know, saying we want to get our ferrets legalized. That's all we want is just, you know, to have our ferrets treated the same way as anybody else treats their cat or their dog. And I don't see why they're, and I couldn't find any reason why they wouldn't. Yeah. I, you know, I've, I grew up with dogs and cats and stuff, and um, you know, I I like dogs and cats just fine. But I've always wanted to have a pet ferret. I when I was a little girl, I watched Beastmaster and thought they were the coolest little things, and like I'd always wanted one. But you know, living in California, it was like, well, no, we can't do it. it. They're illegal and stuff. And finally, it was this past year where I was like, you know what? I'm just going to embrace my libertarian ways and. How we believe that unjust laws are meant to be broken, and uh, and go finally get you know a ferret of my own and see what they are, uh, what they're like, and they're all that they're cracked up to be. But I was you know super excited, and they have like not disappointed. <laughs> you definitely have to have a sense of humor though. That that's that's for sure. they are they are crazy, and they just like falls to the wall as soon as they're up. The great thing is that they only they're only awake for about four hours out of the day. They're very like narcoleptic. Once they're done, they're done. They just pass out and then, and then that's it. So it's just this ball of energy. They're getting into everything and uh, you know, you're chasing after them or whatever, but uh, you know, they're a lot of fun too. So you're just having plenty. We, we've got like little cat toys around the house. We, we've kept one of our Amazon boxes that are like in a nice tube. Like it's in the middle of our kitchen. We, we can't get rid of it because they love it so much. So it's like a toddler. They play with the boxes, not the toys. <laughs> I think it froze for a second there. So, oh, it's just like toddlers, right? The toddlers, they play with boxes and not the toys. And, and they're just a ball of energy until they... Oh, I'm sorry, you broke up for a second. Uh, yeah, yeah, we're crashing oh, there. Yeah. yeah, yeah, we crashed for a second. <laughs> okay. No, I was just explaining that they sound like toddlers. You know, like those one and a half oh, to yeah. three year olds. Yeah, sound like toddlers. Yeah. They go balls to the wall. Until they crash and then they're passed out. You can carry them around by their by their arm and they'll still stay asleep. <laughs> yeah. So it, does, it sounds like a lot of fun and it sounds like you're. You know, I just watch your kids. They seem to enjoy it. And you know, that's. I had a dog. I'm not a big pet person. I animals seem to like me, but I'm not one who wants to clean up after them. Right. It's. A, I have enough trouble cleaning up after myself. So you know, I don't want to take the added responsibility of cleaning up after a pet. But you know, for people who do and for people who need a you know, my, my fiance, she likes to have a, um, a companion cat. Now her last cat was 13 years old. She recently passed away and we haven't gotten a replacement yet, but you know, it's not time, but still, you know, there's, there's an emotional backing to that. There's uh, but also there's a, uh, for kids. I mean, we had a dog when my kids were young and it was, you know, I didn't particularly so I having a dog, but the kids liked having a dog. There was something about it that's good for kids it was about having a pet about being not just being responsible for it, but about it's sense of responsibility for something other than yourself, I guess, that you care about something other than yourself. Yeah. And these guys are, they're pretty, pretty hardy. You know, they're, they're really great with our kids. You know, one of them, we, we nickname them Chompy. <laughs> I've got an Ivar and a Bjorn. Ivar is my really sweet one. Bjorn, he does the, uh, the, the lick, lick chomp thing which it, we're trying to break him of that. So you can get a little nippy, but even though, even with that, you know, it's not like a, I don't know, a 
they're, they're still not a dangerous animal to have around children. Um, no, well, my, yeah. no, my hamsters used it, to bite me all the time, right? You go in there to try to play with your hamster, those suckers would bite you all the time. So, yeah. But we don't have any problem with hamster. So, right. <laughs> or, or snakes, you know, I, I don't understand the people who get snakes for pets, but yet I wouldn't sit there and tell them you can't have snakes for pets. It seems to me like, it almost seems to me like, I hate to bring into kind of the modern, the nice thing about talking to you about ferrets, we didn't have to talk about what's going on in the modern world today, yeah. but it's, it's Easter totally. Sunday. Happy Easter to you, by the way, as we Happy record Easter, this. Yeah. Um, but it almost seems to me like there's a bit of fear that we don't understand something. And then so we, someone says a story and we get fear. And then so that fear leads to rules that don't really make sense when you kind of look at it in the, in context. Yeah, and I think that's just kind of an ongoing problem, as we're seeing right now, too, you know, just fear, react out of fear. Um, but I know that, so right before we got on here, I reached out to the legalizedferrets.org and just wanted to find out what was the most recent, where, where we're at right now as far as legalization. And because uh, the last I heard was that all that really needed to happen was Game & Wildlife needed to do a CEQA study on them and see what the environmental impact would be if you legalize ferrets. It was kind of cost something like $600,000 and then that was the last I heard of it. Well, from legalizedferret.org, we hear that they that was just another hoop for them to jump through. And when they said that they would fund the $600,000, they were basically the, uh, the answer was, oh, well, you know, no, never mind because we're just gonna have to deal with all these environmentalist groups. and it's kind of like they just don't want to do it. So they would rather just be lazy about it. They're not really, doesn't seem like they're really caring to enforce the law or anything, but they just want to take the easy way out and not, you know, not have to deal with any, any groups or anything like that. Yeah. Well, I, my family is a family full of bureaucrats. So I actually get some of the bureaucrat perspective. And so it's just kind of a nice is you're going to be a politician. You get a chance to talk to people who are bureaucrats. So you can kind of get both sides. And mm -hmm. now I can't speak to this group particularly, so I can only kind of talk about bureaucrats in general, is that they don't like to spend their time on, on something that is gonna be not go anywhere. So if they're gonna spend a lot of time and effort on something and they know that once it hits the legislature, it's just gonna die, they're not gonna to wanna to spend their time on it. It's just, they have too much stuff to do. And so realistically, they're looking at the, the politics and they're saying, it's just not gonna go anywhere. So we're not gonna spend our time and resources and our credibility essentially talking to legislators about an issue that we're not going to get anywhere. So that's actually something that has to be done at the voting level. They're going to have to actually put in legislatures to go in there and carry the water for them. And, you know, and it's just hard because you look at a ferret issue as, a, as someone who's running for assembly, you're talking about a ferret issue. Well, you know, you're not going to get many votes talking about ferrets, but you might get votes when you're talking about government overreach. And you're talking about how this is just an example of government overreaching and, and that how we're taking something issue with the ferrets when there maybe there is in an environmentally sensitive area you might want to ban certain types of of pets because if they get out maybe it's it's causing an extreme danger so that's maybe like in hawaii maybe there is a reason for it but in california where we're such a diverse place where shasta county is vastly different than death valley right that okay. making a statewide uh policy is just stupid it, it just doesn't even make sense on the on its face well, yeah, and then the other part, too, is uh, I was mentioning how domesticated they are. They're not a very, when it comes to temperatures, they're not very hardy. I think I, I think their max temperature range is somewhere between, like, the 40s and the high 80s as far as temperatures that they can tolerate. Anything below that or above that, they will, they'll stroke out, hypothermia, those kinds of things. So they're not very adept to some of our you know, the wide ranges of environments we have in this state. Like right here in, in Hanford, we get freezing winters and we get, you know, 100 degree weather in the summer. Like if any of them got out, they, the, the environment would kill them off. Yeah, I used to live in Selma. It gets hot down there. We didn't have air conditioning in our house. It was it was a brutal summers down there. And so, yeah, if they're temperature, if they're not temperature resilient, they're going to have some trouble. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Let me see if I can get um, Ivar over here. Yeah. Oh, I'm sure the people would love to see you. That's one of those yeah, nice things. You don't have to bring a ferret to the studio, you know? You can, no, you can bring the so studio. He would, he would have to do that. I ended up getting a, a, I'm a, I'm one of those Renaissance fair geeks, but 
I had somebody at the Renaissance Fair last year build him a little custom leather harness, which actually I have right here. But he goes on he goes on walks and stuff. <laughs> so. See, that's cool. And it's yeah. like here in Sacramento, they just they just um, legalized chickens like a couple of years ago, so we could finally so in the city. Yeah, so we can finally actually yeah. have chickens here in the city. And you're going well. I, and it's funny that you bring that up. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, it's um, fine. We just found out because we're you know, we're in Central California. Uh, I'm in Hanford, and it's a very agricultural area. And everywhere around us could have chickens in their backyard. So I didn't even think anything of it until a friend of mine gets cited for having chickens in her backyard and told that she has to have them removed. And mind you, this is like just the day after Newsom put out the stay at home mandates. And it's just kind of like, this is what we're going to be dealing with right now. And also when, since when were we not allowed to have chickens? And I guess it was about back in 2011 they said, um, yeah, yeah, they changed the ordinance. You couldn't have chickens. Uh, they, you couldn't have chickens, and uh, and that that's all there was to it. And so we, we brought it up. We started rattling the cages, and I was happy to hear that our council actually listened to us because I my point was like this might sound kind of silly right now, coming you know at a time when there's so many other things that we think that we need to be worrying about. However, I think it is also in line with being a, people being able to be self-autonomous when we're seeing shortages in the grocery store of certain essential items or what we would deal with, you know, mm -hmm. usually need eggs and bread and milk and that, you know, that's what Americans usually fill the fridges with. But uh, to not be able to have your own eggs in your backyard, it's just ridiculous. And so I'm, anyway, I'm really happy to hear that our council is going to look at an ordinance that was written years ago they didn't even want to look at, not not this set of uh, council members, but the council then didn't even want to take a look at it. So now this current council is going to look at it. Hopefully we can get chickens legalized in yeah, it, it's, it's so bizarre that they, they pass these laws. Well, essentially, I know the Sacramento and County chicken ban. The, ah, there's there's a little guy. There's a, yeah. And if they want to actually feed, <laughs> they can follow you. You do daily cat snake videos, right? And so what's your hashtag for your daily cat snake videos? Yeah, I, I had a friend of mine. <laughs> yeah, I had a friend of mine. He was just like, he went, did one of these posts of, hey, I'm just reaching out, checking in on you guys, see how everybody's doing. And I, I commented, hey, I'm still here and kicking. And he goes, how are those cat snakes? And uh, and suddenly I realized, oh, my God, they're so entertaining that I should probably just start putting them up on a daily basis just to, you know, brighten up people's days, even if it's just for a minute or so. But, yeah, so I've been posting it's a good up for, of videos. Of, they're good for a smile, you know, and these days we can all use a smile, I think, is kind of a nice thing. So I enjoy them. I enjoy watching them. They're good for a smile, watching those things. So. <laughs> yeah. I mean, high demand, for sure. But, yeah, and this is Ivar. He's my little... That's my little buddy. He follows me around. He is definitely, he's found missing remotes under the sofa for us. He's ratted out our children for throwing wrappers underneath the sofa because he pushes them out. So he's my little buddy. Yeah. No, those guys are, those guys are cute. Um, I think, and you can follow, what's the hashtag? I know you're using a hashtag. Is it what? Hashtag cat snakes? Uh, daily, daily cat snakes. Daily cat snakes. Hashtag daily cat snakes. So you guys can search for your hashtag daily cat snakes and you can go find her, her cat snakes. Because those, they're adorable on those cat snake videos. I actually do encourage you guys to spend a minute, go watch them every day, get a smile on your face. It's especially during this period of time <laughs> where, you know, it's hard to smile these days. There's so much, if you're yeah. watching the news or, you know, you turn on the news or just oh, go outside, just go into the store is a depressing, it's kind of depressing these days. And so, you know, anything that can bring people a smile. Is, I'm encouraging. You. So I appreciate you on your daily cat snakes. I thank you for that. Oh yeah, no, I, I didn't realize how in high demand they would be until I started doing it, and everybody seems to be getting a kick out of it. Um, <laughs> and I, I also laugh too, like you know, they're they're so worried that they're going to get out and procreate and uh, overpopulate and all that. Well, I found that they don't overpopulate in a way that you normally would think that they do. So, for instance, I wanted to get, I finally said I want to get a ferret, and I was with my sister, and she goes, you know what, I'm going to get a ferret too. So we both got ferrets on the same day. Two weeks later, she went out and got her second ferret. A few weeks later uh, after that, uh, my brother went and got two ferrets of his own, and I got another one. So now in our family, what started off as one or two ferrets, we now have six. <laughs> so. 
They're multiplying, but not in the way that people think. <laughs> yeah, it's not like cats. I mean, no one else goes by, hey, my friend got a cat. I'm going to go get a cat. No one does that. But these things are, well, they're cute. And I guess if you have energy, if you have the energy to kind of keep up with them, and then, you know, knock yourself out. I mean, we've got to stop letting people tell us how to run our daily lives. It's just, it's become, out, it's getting out of hand. And yeah. Okay. No, and whether it's ferrets or, you know, telling you which, you know, where you go to church on Easter, it really doesn't matter. Ultimately, is these are decisions that have to be left to the individuals because there is no society without individuals. Yeah, I mean, I think that as, you know, low on the totem pole as this issue might be, given our current affairs and stuff, I think that it's a good representation of just how much power we've let government have over our lives. Some of the the lack of common sense that they'll have over certain issues and just thinking that they know what's best for us when, you know, it should be left up to us. And now like, you know, I'm seeing, I'm seeing the same people who have helped enact some of these draconian measures now complaining about how other counties or other States are taking it even further, but it's kind of like, you know, they, they feel like, well, because we're not as bad as them, I feel justified. But it's like, I'm trying to point out, like, you guys helped set into motion at a very slippery slope just a few weeks back. Not even a few weeks. I think we're like, what, two or three weeks into this. Yeah, the slippery slope said, exists, right? Everybody says right. the slippery slope's not an argument, but it exists. It's actually how things work. You know, one step leads to the next, leads to the next. And if you're not very careful, you can end up someplace where, you know, you didn't want to be. And I think that's one of the things we're watching. The very same mm -hmm. people who were, you know, three years ago claiming about a rising tide of fascism are essentially now installing the tools that a fascist, that a genuine fascist will need to, you know, accomplish their goals. And it's, and we're sitting here watching it and you're going, you people, don't you even listen to yourselves? <laughs> I know it, it just, it's mind boggling, but sadly it's also not surprising too. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean like it, when they put out the stay at home orders, it was only going to be two weeks. It was kind of like, I wanted to call BS on that. You know, it only being two weeks because really like what we're facing and the spread and the timelines and all that. I feel like it was just a way of like easing us into this uh, and that they would keep going for longer. And sure enough, they keep every week. They they push it longer out. You know, it started off with two weeks. Now it's going to then it was a month. Now we're it'll be a you know, total of two months. And during this time of lockdown, they are slowly rolling back more and more of our own liberties and freedoms and finding us. And, you know, I think that they can get away with not saying we're under martial law because we have spent so many years militarizing our police force and nothing, you know, nothing against our police force, but, you know, they, they've been able to militarize them to the point where, you know, it's not really necessary to call in the, the military anymore to enact martial law. No, the police have all the equipment they need. They actually don't need the military to come in. It's what they don't have is the numbers. I mean, if LA ever decided to rise up, there's nothing the 10,000 band police force could do about it. But, but in a smaller town or places where, you know, it's, there's not much a, the average person can actually do except this long, slow process of voting different. And that's kind of the thing, you know, we just have to get, start getting people to vote different. And, you know, hopefully, you know, it was, the issues like we can issue some ferrets, we can use this as a symbol. It says, look, it, 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 the ferret issue is a small issue by itself, but it's symbolic of how the overreach of government has gone. It's how it's gone on. Wanting to protect things like property value, we have gone to banning chickens, which is part of a natural, you know, being able to take care of yourself is a natural part of human existence. And yet we're going to ban chickens because to protect somebody else's theoretical property value. It's what property value are we protecting? Are we protecting use value or are we protecting resale value? I mean, those are two competing values. And which one do we actually care more about? And for me, as I'm watching as houses in my neighborhood get sold for $500,000, I'm living on the edge of the ghetto and people in my neighborhood can't afford this. And so the people who live here are getting pushed out. And it's the same, it's the same mindset that's actually doing this. It's, it's the same mindset of we want to protect property values, the theoretical resale value at the expense of Things like long-term emotional value, sentimental value, uh, or what I call the family safety net value. You know, I get to live in my grandpa's house, right? And it's the family safety net. It was here when my family fell apart and needed help. And this house was here for us to catch us and, and help us put us back on our feet. And so that is something I don't think we talk much, we, we have forgotten and we don't talk about. And so 
it's nice to actually sit here and where we're talking ferrets, we get to have a bit of fun talking ferrets. There is the bigger underlying issue that is actually symbolic of it. That is symbolic of. Yeah, I I agree. Um, I, yeah, I just again, you know, having that that self autonomy, saying what what you sorry, you've got the ferrets running around now. They're they're loose <laughs> and distracting. <laughs> well, we've got two minutes, so so we I don't go over eight twenty eight minutes, so I the Gail doesn't get mad at me. But we got two minutes. I want to ask you. You've been you've been sewing masks now. As someone who is not crafty, I have no craft skills at all. How could someone who's not crafty help with, with kind of help in these days, you know, creating masks or what can someone like me do whose best skill is actually getting on TV and talking to people, but would actually like to help in some other ways. And I well, see I you're, not- you're a very crafty person. So that's, you're the one I'm going to ask, right? Since I've got you here in front of me. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, sewing is one thing. I, I was joking around with a friend of mine who's still pretty new to sewing and, Uh, She's like, I'm not the best or anything, but it's like, hey, you getting, getting, figuring out how to sew in a straight line, like there's something to be said about that. It's way more difficult than you would think. So, but, you know, for anybody else, though, I think it's even just basic kindergarten skills could you, with basic kindergarten skills, you can help out. And uh, it's getting a hold of like the, the different patterns that they have available on the website. And you print out the uh, those patterns and yeah, just put it on a piece of paper and then take fabric, outline it, cut it and create like basically little kits. And that's what got dropped off with me is a bunch of and I'm still like grinding away at them. But I got some like 60 or 70 pre-cut masks sent over to me. Everything's all wrapped up like the straps and then the two sides or whatever, all like put together in like little rolls. And then I just unroll it and sew them together and then, you know, they're good to go. So yeah. anybody who's going to help out could just cut out fabric. That that would make a huge difference. Yeah, well, I, you know, it's nice to see that people are just pulling together, kind of doing the best they can to help their communities. And we are out of time. So thank you for coming on. <laughs> and I want to thank everybody for watching. You can find more about ferrets and all this other stuff at, uh, and all the information we talked about will post it on our webpage, libertariancounterpoint.com. You can catch us on Access Sacramento. This show will air on the 23rd, but it'll be on YouTube up before that. And Kalish, thank you for thank you for showing. This is Gail Morgan thanking you for watching the Libertarian Counterpoint each Thursday at 8 p.m. Channel 17 on Comcast, on YouTube, and on Facebook. We invite you to come again next week for the Libertarian Counterpoint.